Live NFL trivia every Tuesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge and have a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. Norm Van Brocklin is one of the greatest quarterbacks in NFL history. He's a nine-time Pro Bowler, a member of the All-1950s team. He won MVP of the league in 1960, won the NFL Championship with the Eagles in 1960, and is a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I don't think anyone's got a bad thing to say about him as a player, as he's one of the all-time greats, especially when talking about the NFL before the merger. But as a coach? Yeah, not so much. Despite being a head coach for 13 seasons, he made the postseason a grand total of zero times. Forget Marvin Lewis having a seemingly endless leash with the Bengals, at least he could get to the playoffs. Van Brocklin finished with a winning record just three times in his 13 seasons, and won less than 40% of his games over his career. As it turns out, Van Brocklin actually holds the record for most seasons as a head coach without making the playoffs. That raises the question, what was the straw that broke the camel's back? What was the moment where he finally got relieved of his duties and never coached again? Allow me to introduce you to the moment that Van Brocklin got fired. On a warm November day in Miami, Van Brocklin had about the worst possible day imaginable, both on and off the field. And this is the story behind that. First, we need some context, because obviously, one game by itself isn't going to be the reason a coach gets fired. In 1973, the Atlanta Falcons were a really good team. They had a top 10 offense and defense, and finished the season at 9-5, even rattling off seven straight wins at one point midway through the year. Unfortunately for Atlanta, they didn't make the postseason, as they lost the NFC West to the 12-2 Rams and finished behind Washington at 10-4 for the lone wild card. But a lot of people had them doing big things in 1974. After eight years of not making it to the postseason, they were finally going to get there in 1974. However, as should be apparent by now, this was not the case. Not even close. Following a string of injuries and poor roster management, the Falcons were back in the cellar. A 24-0 shutout loss to the Dallas Cowboys to open the season set the tone for what would become a disastrous campaign. They started off 0-3 through the end of September, and things didn't get much better in October, as by the end of the month, they were 2-5. And, and just in case things couldn't get any worse, their next game was on the road at the Orange Bowl against the Miami Dolphins the same Miami team that went 5-2 and, and looked like they were on cruise control for another season. The same Miami team that had made three straight Super Bowls and had won two straight. The same Miami team that had not lost a game at the Orange Bowl since October 3rd, 1971 and had rattled off 27 straight wins at home. Basically, if you thought things were going to turn around for Atlanta, they were not. And that takes us to the day in question. November 3rd, 1974. And as the Falcons traveled to Miami, they got absolutely whooped. Miami destroyed the Falcons by a final score of 42 to seven. Atlanta turned the ball over four times. Miami outgained the Falcons 355 to 196 in total yardage. Bob Greasy had a fantastic game, finishing with two touchdown passes and a passer rating of 113.3. If you want to see another video I made about Greasy and a remarkable game that he had a couple of years later against the Seattle Seahawks, click the card in the upper right corner. And while Greasy had a great game, the Falcons' passing attack was not good at all. The combined passer rating of the team between starting quarterback Bob Lee and his replacement Pat Sullivan was 31.6. For some perspective, if you did nothing but spike the ball into the ground on every single play, your passer rating would actually be a couple of points higher than what the Falcons put together on this day. And to make matters worse, this was the worst road loss for the Falcons since the merger, as the last time they had a road loss that bad was on December 1st, 1968, where they lost 44 to nothing to the eventual NFL champion Baltimore Colts. After the game, which all but eliminated them from postseason contention, you had the post-game press conference. After a game like that, with the season they've had and the embarrassment that just transpired on the field, what would most coaches do in that situation? Usually it goes one of two ways. 
They're either clearly dejected, taking responsibility for the loss, and saying that we have to figure out a way to right the ship and get things fixed because this was unacceptable, or they're angry, and they lash out at players for not playing hard or doing their jobs. Instead, Van Brocklin chooses a third option that I didn't even know existed. Because at this post-game press conference, following a 35-point loss, he challenged a writer to a fight. No, I am not making that up. He challenged a reporter to a fight, and then extended that invitation to everyone else in attendance, including other writers, broadcasters, and photographers. You might be asking why he did this. Why would a coach want to pick a fight with a member of the media? Well, a few weeks prior, Van Brocklin said that he was a fighter, which clearly meant in the context of fighting to turn things around and not going down without a fight following a rough start. A reporter asked him after the game if that was still the case. Clearly talking about the context of how you fight to get the team to fight back now that they're all but eliminated from the postseason, and how you get them to rebound after an embarrassing 35-point blowout. And Van Brocklin took the question as actual fighting words. Fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, no fight ended up breaking out. But the situation was a black eye on the team, the organization, and on Van Brocklin. In fact, the situation was so bad that Cowboys head coach Tom Landry, who had no connection to this whatsoever, jokingly asked reporters the next day, anybody want to fight? And to make matters even worse for Van Brocklin, team owner Rankin Smith was in attendance that day in Miami. He saw everything unfold with his own two eyes. And after the game, and after those comments, he had enough. Because the very next day, Smith relieved Van Brocklin of his duties. It was a move that Falcons fans had been clamoring for all along, and was long overdue. But after that embarrassment, it finally happened. Smith said, Van Brocklin has been relieved of his duties as general manager and coach of the Atlanta Falcons. I haven't been hiding in Miami. He was replaced by Marion Campbell, who might have been worse, and who somehow got a second chance with the Falcons in the 1980s. But that's a story for another video. Coaches have had some bad days before, but this one might be the worst of them all. A 35-point loss with the odor in attendance, compounded with an embarrassing post-game press conference where you challenge the media to a fight, is not exactly the best way to keep your job. Van Brocklin's seven years as head coach of the Falcons had the team consistently near the basement and irrelevant. But even though the era was usually pretty quiet, by the time it ended, it ended with a bang. Be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JerryGrader9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.